Hello, I'm Stephen Travers, and you're welcome to the Miami Chauvin Peace Center Online, a truth and reconciliation platform project. Continuing our Speaking for Myself series, our witnesses today are Sarah Convery, whose three uncles were murdered at their home in White Cross County Armagh on January the 4th, 1976. John Martin and Brian died at the scene, and Anthony died a month later. And Becca Smith, whose uncle, John McConville, was murdered the following day, January the 5th, in an atrocity that will live in infamy as the King's Mill Massacre. Our executive producer and a co-founder of TARP, Eugene Reevy, joins us from White Cross and County Armagh, and the Truth and Reconciliation Platform Ambassador to the UK, Joe Campbell, joins us from London. You're all very welcome. If I can begin with uh, Sarah. Sarah, can you just tell us uh, about your experience and the experience that uh, changed the lives of your family? Yeah, well, first of all, uh, thanks very much for, for having me. Um, it's, it's great to be able to take part in one of these events. I've been following, um, following the recordings on the TARP website um, for, for a while now. And, uh, I think it's you know really beneficial um, and really interesting to hear other people's insights um, and the experiences that others have had. Um, and I think that this session, um, you know, having sort of the insights from 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 myself and Becca is is a new um, I suppose a new perspective um, of a of a different and uh, a new generation um, that have been impacted by by these events that that took place um, you know before we were born. But uh, it's uh, very interesting to see. Um, I suppose to hear. I'll be interested to hear how Beck has been impacted in in her life. Um, and I know that certainly the the way that that I've been impacted and you know my my siblings and my cousins um, who are all of of, of similar age group um, is is going to be all different depending on the individual. Um, but um, I suppose in terms of of of, of my own story, um, it's 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 an it's a difficult thing to 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 really talk about because um growing up we you know we always knew um of the boys and you would hear you know i would hear my parents and my grandmother and my cousins all talking about the boys the three boys and they were almost like these mythical figures <laughs> we didn't know an awful lot about them but we knew what they looked like because you you would see um their mask cards up on the mantelpiece photographs of them on the wall and uh we would go to the anniversary mass um every year um at the beginning of january um and it was always a big family event um we would have go to carganani chapel uh which is um our parish in our parish and all the aunties and uncles and the cousins would be there and as a child for for me it was just great fun because all your cousins would be there and you'd get to go back to our, our uncle's house and there'd be tea and sandwiches and buns and um everybody would do maybe a little bit of a party piece or something as a child and um, it was actually my memories of of the boys anniversary every year are very happy memories um those were probably the days of innocence you might say because uh, for me it was just a very happy family occasion um, and it wasn't really until you start started to grow up a little bit that you started to ask questions about you know well who were the boys and uh, apart from them being my uncle what actually happened to them and um, and it's funny and I don't know if this is an Irish thing or maybe it's just a way that families deal with trauma and grief but it wasn't, we were never really sat down and told as children, this is what happened. And, you know, they were murdered and, and this is who we believe murdered them. It, was, it wasn't like that at all. It was more a case of trying to figure out for yourself through overhearing adult conversations what actually happened. And I remember um, my uncle Seamus, uh, who used to have us all back to his house after they, the anniversary mass every year he had he still has this huge collection of scrapbooks 
Um, and every newspaper article that was ever written um, around the time of the, the boys' murder and um, right up until, I suppose, that the present day, as uh, back then, he had every paper clipping. And we would um, go down to the spare room in his house and we were when we were children and we'd flick through the, the scrapbooks. And it wouldn't just be stories about the boys' murders. There would also be scrapbooks of the boys and daddy and my other uncles and aunties for all the different achievements that they would have been, you know, in the local newspapers. So f mostly football, <laughs> football or whatever. And you kind of just, it was like a patchwork quilt nearly. You're trying to piece together all the different fragments of your family history uh, as a child. And I think, you know, it, it it came together in that way for me. Um, and I think I was almost um, oblivious to the extent of the trauma that all of my family had endured until I got a, that bit older and I was in my teen, teen years. And um, I think, you know, there's a lot of things that happen in life that, you know, that, that, that you know, that make you become aware, more aware of things. But I think what happened was there was a, a more of a willingness to actually talk openly about um, the circumstances of the boy's murder and, you know, who could have been responsible. Um, and that during my teenage years and when I started university, that's when it all really began to come together for me. And um, I remember um, whenever dad had first started working with the, um, the historical inquiries team, and even before that with, you know, some of the victims groups like the Pat Nukin Center and around the time that the Barron report was being, being drawn up and there were subcommittees um, in, in, the, in Dáil Éireann. Um, and I was at Trinity College at the time and would have joined, um, joined some of the families that were being represented um, by the Pat Nukin Centre at that time. Uh, that's when I, the details and the enormity of the situation really became apparent to me because I was getting to meet other families who had endured the same tragedy and the same trauma. And you then the pieces of the puzzle just became a lot more clear and I think just the the intense uh, injustice of it all really became apparent, and uh, it's it's interesting how in our family I feel like it took uh, that amount of time um, and that amount of I suppose other families talking about what happened to them and meeting other families for 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 even for my own father like to really open up about you know what happened and to really talk about it more openly and it wasn't just you know the boys were no longer just these mythical figures that we would hear about um it all became very real um and and i suppose the the extent of the injustice that had been carried out um became very uh almost too real because i think when you the more you know uh the harder it is <laughs> because you know um not only was it you know the boys weren't taken away by the troubles and, and that was really all we used to say for a long long time when we were when we were younger um and it you set, felt separated from it you know you felt like that was you know very much in the past but um it all became very it all it, it became very much part of our present then and the more the story started to come out and the more the truth started to um to, to, to filter out so i think now um, we're at a point where we know almost as much as we, we can possibly know at this stage. Um, and really we're, you're left with um, a, a very strong sense of sadness because, because it's, because, because you get to witness over and over again, continued injustices 
and cruel, cruel behavior to, to victims and their families. Um, and that's very hard to accept in a modern civilized society. Um, and there's not, a, there's not an awful lot of people of our generation who, who have to deal with these issues. Um, and that can sometimes make it hard as well because a lot of your friends, you know, don't necessarily understand the same issues that you are having to, to face, the same disappointments um, that you're having to, to constantly face, and, you know, with the, I suppose, the, the quest for truth and justice. Um, but it's a very sort of bitter, it's a very bitter reality to accept that um, so many victims and fa their families are, are really being left out in the cold and that you're you're witnessing in real time this horrific injustice and um, that's just repeating over and over again <laughs> and you know hurt is being put on top of more hurt and really just compounding grief um where there's already unspeakable amounts of grief and trauma to begin with um and it makes it very difficult um and for people as a, of our generation who are impacted, um, whose families have been impacted, it's, you know, you, you almost get sick of hearing the same arguments about, you know, it's the 21st century, we need to move on, we need to draw a line in the sand and we need to, you know, uh, move into a more progressive society. Um, and how are we supposed to pro progress as a society if people keep harping on about the past? Um, and that is, that, that's very, it's very hard not to, to react to that type of um, rhetoric um, when, you know, when you know that, you know, who's, who's the hurt and, and the pain that's there and the inability to actually move on um, for, for society to really heal itself and for people to be trusting of, of those who are governing them and, um, and I suppose of any, of, you know, to being able to trust um, being able to trust the, I suppose the, the systems that are governing your society um, when, when you've been continuously let down like that and the hurt that they've caused to your loved ones. So I think that, you know, I, I suppose the main point that I was trying to get at is that um, it's, it, for those of us who are, and, and Becca probably had similar um, experience, that, it can be very difficult to um, to accept those arguments that we should move on, and you do feel a sense of responsibility um, to your family, um, particularly when you, you know you know that it's. It, it, when when I was in my twenties, I thought, well, this will not still be going on when I'm in my thirties. <laughs> and now that I'm in my thirties, I'm actually starting to think, well, this will probably still be going on when I'm in my forties. So you become a lot more jaded over time and a lot less optimistic, um, which can be, you know, which is difficult to deal with. But um, yeah, I think there's definitely just an enduring sense of loss, an enduring sense of sadness, um, but also a sense of responsibility. Um, on those of us who've sort of in, lived um, through the family experience, um, albeit a, a generation later. Well, um, Sarah, you mentioned, there's a couple of things there that were really interesting uh, that you mentioned, a couple of words in particular that stand out for me. <clears throat> One was that um, you said that when you were very small, you were oblivious to what happened. Mm. Uh, in hindsight, do you look back and say that your parents actively shielded you from this because it would be difficult um, not to hear some stories in the schoolyard or some, somebody say something or mention these things that they would have heard about at school. Did that ever happen? Um, it, to be honest, it didn't really. <laughs> and I think maybe that's one of the benefits of coming from a small country school. Like we, um, it didn't really um and I went to school with a lot of my cousins as well but you know I do think that like my parents did try and probably it probably was a, a way of trying to protect us um it's not that they didn't talk about the boys they talked about them very affectionately but um, the circumstances of their death would have been a, a, a much bigger mystery at that age um I think that you know that there's obviously going to be things that you'll find out um 
I know that there, there was a time when I was probably when I just started secondary school um, when you know there was a couple of stories in the newspaper that I had read and I think I was only in first year in secondary school and um, I remember my form teacher um, she was a nun um, in in our ladies school in Uri and um, sister Yvonne she was she was always very kind to me and I remember her taking me to the side one day um, after uh, form class and just to say you know I, I saw that there was a couple of stories in the paper over the weekend and just want you to know that you know we're here to support you and if you ever need to talk to anybody outside your family you know I'm here for you and I remember at that time uh, being a little bit uh maybe maybe a little bit embarrassed because when you're first when you're in that age you know anything would embarrass you but I think it was almost like oh god is everybody talking about me now you know because the fact that she had seen this article in the newspaper and she saw fit to pull me to the side I was probably a little bit self-conscious um and through sometimes especially when you're that age you don't want you don't want to stand out from the crowd you just want to be the same as all your friends so <laughs> yeah I probably did go through a phase of being a little bit self-conscious about it um at that age because I was only really starting to find out things myself um never mind being able to, to talk about it with anyone else outside of my own family you you also mentioned the word puzzle you said trying to make sense of the puzzle um as you got older and when you were in um in Trinity um that means that there were certain things that you wanted to discover. Did that influence your um, decision to become a lawyer? Um, I think my decision to, to study law in the first place was probably down to a sense of that, you know, that there was a real, um, a real sense of injustice and the fact that, you know, when at that age, I knew that, you know, this terrible atrocity had been committed on my, upon my own family, and there was never any justice for it. And, you know, I think a lot of lawyers start out very idealistic, thinking that they can change the world. <laughs> and uh, of course, I had those, uh, those aspirations as well. And, you know, a really strong interest in human rights law when I was in university as well. So, yeah, of course, that was influenced. Um, also, there was probably a little bit of subliminal uh, messaging coming from my my dad, who always wished that he was a lawyer himself. <laughs> so <laughs> I was probably fulfilling some of his his like his um his dreams as well. So yeah, I think you know you do you have a strong sense of what you think is right and what's wrong, and um, you know at that age you feel like you can go out and you can really right some of those wrongs and you did mention as well that we live in a civilized civilized society now mm. it's not that civilized when somebody can deny the uh, truth to somebody i think i think uh you can correct me if i'm wrong that the the the, the truth i.e the files on the case of your uncle's murders have been uh, locked away for something like 86 years mm. that's not uh, really the mark of a civilized society no. is it I think um, my impression of what a civilized society is has really been tested. Um, I used to believe that I was growing up in a civilized society. And I remember when I first um, moved to Dublin for university, I used to think I would switch on the radio or the news and you would hear politicians arguing about things like healthcare and taxes and education and you think wow this is a civilized society because they're actually politicians are arguing about proper issues that politicians are supposed to argue about um and then you know the, look look what's happened um down here in the south recently with the you know the mother and baby home scandal and just goes to show that you know your idea of what you think is a civilized society isn't always um, is, is going to be tested all the time because um, I suppose how a society deals with its past is is the true indication of how civilized it is. And um, you're right, Stephen, that you know the continued um, cover up um, and just the the inability to 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 show any sort of respect um, towards victims and their families has 
is is not the mark of a civilized society and yeah you it's a harsh reality that sort of comes becomes harsher every year unfortunately and it's not it's not just uh, uh, a passive cover up it's an active cover up because as we'll we'll hear from uh, from becca a little later on I'll just uh, ask you that you know when your family is growing up and people are getting to, towards some sort of normality all albeit the fact that they have these terrible memories and this terrible uh, story running through the family and perhaps even passing down intergenerational thing you were hit by a double whammy because your father out of the blue was uh, accused under parliamentary privilege of being involved in the in the king's mill massacre which we'll talk about in, in a few minutes that must have absolutely devastated your family and you were old enough at that stage to understand the gravity of something like that yeah i that that is actually the incident that i was um i was talking about <laughs> the non my my foreign teacher pulling me to the side to talk to me about um yeah i mean that was very confusing time <laughs> i would have been um 13 i think um yeah, it was, it was, it was really, it was, it was very confusing um, because you're still learning yourself about, you know, what happened at those times. I had, I had known, I'd heard of the Kingswell's massacre at the time um, and I knew that it happened, but, you know, to obviously have that sort of a, an allegation um, levied against someone in your own family, in particular your, your, your parent is, it was very, it was very hard. And, again i think i was at that um probably immature age where i was so worried about what other people thought of us um going to school you were just so paranoid that people were talking about you behind your back and um i was worried i could see the worry obviously that you know that my parents had and you know you were going to bed at night worried whether you know was somebody going to break into the house and attack you or was um, you know somebody going to believe this and try and um, you know try and try to get revenge um, and you know all of those thoughts went through your head and you could see, sense the fear and I remember like even like my mother like she was very frightened at the time um, as well of you know of somebody trying to to um, to attack the house and it was, it was very strange very very frightening. But one thing that will always stand out um, for me um, was uh, Ronnie Flanagan standing up and in front of the TV cameras and and really putting um, putting the story straight. Um, and I think that I would always be grateful that he did that <laughs> um, because at, when you're that age, being able to say, well, you know it's official that it's not true you know it, it's you know you, you really want to be able to say that to your friends in the playground when, when the topic of conversation comes up so um yeah that was definitely a very tough time uh I'm, I'm actually nearly grateful that I was the age that I was when it happened and that I wasn't any older um because I think that um a lot of anger probably would have set in if I had been older at the time that it happened instead it was more of just a fee. I was more afraid and confused than anything at the time. Yes. And of course, uh, the um, the unwavering support that you got from the survivor of the King's Mill massacre, Alan Black, who uh, immediately contacted your father and your mother to totally rubbish these claims and to say that it was terrible. And uh, then just a couple of months ago to have it, the record set straight. But it, uh, I, I can I can imagine uh, that these things must have been very trying, which brings us on to um, on to Becca. Becca, these two stories are are inextricably linked um, because uh, the Reavy murders happened um, on on the fourth and the very very following night. Uh, this terrible atrocity that we now know as the Kingsman massacre happened. Can you tell us how that affected your life? Hey, yeah, so I think um, before I say anything, though, I think it's nice that, like, listening to what Sarah has said there, it's nice to have that person that understands where I'm coming from. Like, as Sarah said, you know, growing up, 
it was it was difficult when your friends didn't maybe understand that hurt that you were feeling and they just couldn't understand why you were upset about someone you'd never met and um, so I think it it's good to have this platform that you know I've been able to listen to what Sarah's had to say and it's actually been quite encouraging to know that you know we're not on our own and you know we're not like the only family that feels this sort of pain like my generation sort of age so yeah that's been really encouraging to hear um so yeah my uncle was killed as you said the night after um Sarah's uncles were killed um and I think whenever you when you think about what happened that night and you say say it out loud it, it just sounds like something from a horror movie and it always has just sounded like something that it just sounds like it was made up like you you couldn't even write it into a movie the stuff that happened during the troubles on both sides of the community not not just one and it really it does just come out as something completely horrific um I think my experience of it was it sort of made me it's made me want to share my uncle as a person so that he hasn't just become another figure um as part of the troubles you know I always knew that I had an uncle John um his picture hung in my granny's sitting room it was almost like the pride of pride of joy of hers that would have hung in her sitting room um, and my mum would have various photos of you know her and her siblings from their childhood and um, we always knew that John had died um, and that he lived in heaven but we we were never told anything about you know that he was murdered or how he died it was just that he died and you know maybe again as Sarah said it's that innocence she just sort of accepted it it was that was just the norm um, and I guess it maybe wasn't until I was maybe in my mid-teens <clears throat> probably around the time that the inquest began that I really sort of started to fit it all together and you hear adult conversation as Sarah said and you know you, you see as Sarah said about the the scrapbooks my mum has very similar scrapbooks with every cut out that possibly could do with with King's Mill she has every single one of them in a scrapbook and it was my, me and my sister still to this day would probably still just go and sit and flick through it it was almost like the only memory we kind of had of him so we sort of held on to it um so I mean like growing up like my uncle has said, he was always talked about. Um, so although I never met him, um, I feel like I know who he was as a person. Um, he became a Christian whenever he was 16 and he was a member of Newry Baptist. And he just had devoted his life to, you know, sharing God's word with both sides of the community. And it was actually today, I was chatting to my mum about it and she had said that John had actually gone into one of the more Catholic areas um, in South Armagh and had prayed with a, a Catholic woman who, who had been sick at the time and you know he, he didn't have a sectarian bone in his body my family like my grandmother my granddad and nobody um but yeah he he had applied to go to college bible college um in Scotland because he just felt that God was calling him to you know become a missionary in South Africa and that's where he was going so that's why he had gone to work um in the mill you know he was trying to save the money to get his you know college fees together um, and I actually only found out recently that it was a couple of days after he had died that his acceptance letter to Bible college arrived and you know he was due to go sort of that autumn and obviously was never able to take that application but you know as I say I've been told like about his faith in God and you know his witness was like such an inspiration um, to all that sort of knew him and like the lives that he touched and he was just so honest and humble like in his ministry and you know when my mum talks about their childhood like she would talk about and go into Sunday school together and you know go into the gospel hall and you know Bessburg being situated in South Armagh just right in the countryside you know she always used to say it was such an exciting playground for them to go and play in and like they were totally occupied all the time never had a concern they wanted for very little like they just had a really happy, you know, childhood. Um, and I guess growing up, I always sort of viewed my uncle as somewhat old whenever he died. Um, I guess when you're a 10 or 11, you think, well, when you're 20, you're old. And I think it probably wasn't until I hit 20 that I was like, you know, he actually was really, really young um, when he died. And he was only really a child himself. And, you know, whenever I think about what he had to face that night at just 20 years old, you know, it, it saddens me because I think of how scared I would be 
and you know he had no one else around him other than his his friends that he was coming home from work with and to face that ordeal at 20 years old horrifies me it really does um, and I guess the only comfort that sort of definitely my granny anyway and my family would have would have had in that was that you know yes unfortunately yeah, he, d- he did die but you know he had just he'd gone home he just hadn't gone home to be with our family he devoted his life to God and the fact that he'd gone home to be with God was such a comfort to my granny and what it always was until the day that that she died um, and I guess I guess that is my experience of the troubles um I was brought up in Banbridge with my mom and my sister you know I was born in 96 my sister was born in 98 so you know thankfully the sort of main troubles shall we say um was more or less over by that point you know yes I th- but like Banbridge was was blown up when I was two so you know it's not something that really affected me growing up as such you know my biggest experience of the troubles was somebody saying there was a bomb scare um I'm sure as you all well know if someone says that there's a bomb scare you you roll your eyes and you walk on and I think you know how ridiculous our country the stuff that our country has gone through how ridiculous it is that when someone says there's a bomb scare doesn't even phase you <laughs> it's just like oh okay um so you know growing up I don't think I don't think I ever really knew that there was such a thing as a Protestant or a Catholic I guess I think I just assumed that we were just all in one you know we did attend the 12th of July celebrations and you know but it never occurred to me that it was only one art set of people that did this I just assumed it was like an everybody thing um and you know it just wasn't something that was talked about whenever um we were growing up and I guess we were just never told that there was different religions or that you know whatever we were just told you love everybody you be kind to everybody you care for everybody you help everybody in whatever way you can and I guess it wasn't until I went to secondary school um that my well now best friend of over 10 years is from a Catholic upbringing and I think it was at that point that I was like oh they're actually there's people that are somewhat different to um to us um but yeah my like my best friend's a Catholic my mum has Catholic friends I studied on the Springfield Road in West Belfast like with people from the other side of the community which is just something that probably when my mum was with my age at the time would not even have imagined doing um you know we were never told you know don't don't like Catholics like all that sort of stuff that was not the way we were brought up um to the point where you know my best friend Darvila she would have come to the 13th of July with us and I would have gone to Gaelic matches with her and she never understood why I wanted to go to Scarva and I never understood why she wanted to go to a Gaelic match but we just did it for each other because that was our friendship we didn't it didn't matter to us it was normal um she was able to talk about her catholic upbringing and, and vice versa you know i was able to talk about my uncle to her and there was never any sectarian animosity between us you know it was just respect and i guess that was just how i was brought up so i think to this day i will always be thankful <clears throat> to my mom for how she handled um how her brother was killed you know it could have gone completely the other way she could have influenced me to show hatred towards others and it's just not the way it was um <clears throat> but yeah um so I said yeah I wasn't really ever exposed to John's death until maybe my late teens <clears throat> and you know even after finding out some of the horrific details of how they were killed like it still didn't bring me to hate and I remember one day specifically and I can't even remember what it was but it was something that had come out in court and I remember thinking that is absolutely horrific and the first person I phoned was Darvla and it was like Darvla what what is this and I just remember her me crying down the phone being like this is absolutely horrific like what went on and there was me phoning a Catholic and she was the one that was showing me the support and she's always been like that it's always been you know we'll just support each other and it doesn't matter um and I guess I guess if the whole point of King's Mill was to make the families hate Catholics it it didn't work I don't know whether that was what they were hoping from it but you know it didn't work like what as my granny always would have said what would be the point in us hating 
anybody like what would that achieve like it's not going to change what happened to John and his friends it wasn't going to bring him back and I guess that's why we were brought up the way we were you know to accept all to love all and respect all um and I guess um you know I don't think I don't think Kingswell has has impacted it hasn't impacted me to show a hatred or you know show a dislike if anything it's made me more determined to bring the two sides of the community together um I in my university degree I focused my dissertation on the impact of you know reconciliation the impact of the troubles on reconciliation and forgiveness um on my generation specifically in South Armagh and you know I think our generation gets a lot of I don't know grief maybe because we sort of assume because it wasn't maybe our brother or our, our sister or whatever that you know was killed we sort of get assumed that we don't care and we don't understand and we don't know and I guess that's it's kind of unfair to say that um I know from my dissertation you know there was one of the main questions was should should we forget about what happened um in Northern Ireland during the Troubles and an overwhelming majority were like no and that was people you know aged 16 to 21 and their underlying message was no we can't just forget what happened in Northern Ireland you know we have to we have to remember it we have to remember this part of our history um and you know I think the other thing the other thing was the other thing is you know if if Northern Ireland is ever to move forward and move onwards, it's it's going to be our generation that's going to make that difference. Um, so to write our generation off to say that we don't understand and we don't care is it's very, very unfair. Um, you know, I don't even know. Um, you know, to, for us to realize that we're we're all the same. So we are like whether you be a Protestant, whether you be a Catholic, we are all the same. We're in the same boat. You know, if you lost a Catholic, lost a loved one, a Protestant, lost a loved one, you both lost a loved one at the end of the day. And I think people forget that. I think they forget that, you know, the hurt was shown on both sides of the community. And quite a lot of the time, it's it's easy for people to go, oh, well, we hurt more than you do. And that's, it's not fair. And um, one thing that you do, I do hear people saying, and it's, you know, that Kings Mill was one of the worst atrocities of the Troubles. And it's not that I disagree with that, but I also think, you know, well, how does that make other people that lost, you know, loved ones in the Troubles feel, you know, does that make my uncle's death seem more important than, you know, someone else? And that, that to me, I just, I understand the brutality of it, but I just can't accept that, you know, one was worse than the other sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, I guess... I guess it's, I don't know. I guess the troubles for me, it's impacted me. It's, it's strange to say, but it's almost impacted me positively more than negatively because I think when I hear about what went, what happened to my uncle and, you know, I think about, you know, everything else that went on, it makes me more determined for it not to continue. Um, I had a little boy recently. Well, I say recently, he's eight months old. And I look at him and he's just full of pure innocence and he has absolutely no clue about any of this. And he doesn't have to grow up with, you know, the fear of being stuck in a bomb or, you know, the fear of being shot. And the way Sarah was saying, we, we do live in a somewhat civilized society compared to what we did live in or what our parents grew up in anyway. We do have that civilized society. And, you know, there will come a time, however, where he will see photos of our uncle in my mum's house and he is going to ask that question of who is that and of course at that point we will say well that's granny's brother you know that's uncle john and then it'll come the question will come then well what how did he die and at that point i think well do i tell him how he died or do i do what society is almost telling me to do and just to, to forget about it and when i think about it i'm like i can't lie to you know my son when the time comes like I want to be able to share my uncle's experience share it with him and not have any repercussions from it you know I think 
I don't think that, you know, we should have to forget and move on. And I think that's a really unfair thing to say. You know, if the same event was to happen again tonight and tomorrow morning, they were told to forget about it. You know, that would be unheard of. You wouldn't just move on and forget that just wouldn't happen. But yet they're expecting families to do that, even though, yes, it happened 45 years ago, but it still happened. If the same thing happened tonight, it would be the same event. You know, and I just want, I would love for Northern Ireland to just become a place where we can openly talk about our hurts and our losses and to share it with each other on both sides of the community. I think there's a lack of knowledge um, around all of this. You know, you sort of know what happened on your own side, but you don't always know the full story of what happened on the other. And I think that's what our generation needs. We need that space to sit down with each other and speak and realize that we're no different. As Sarah was talking there, a lot of what she was saying rings true in our family too. A lot of our experiences um, are similar. And, you know, I don't think people realize that. I don't think they realize how similar the two sides of the community are. Um, but I think the one problem that our family faces, shall we say, is, you know, the lack of truth. Um, people talk about reconciliation and, you know, they talk about forgiveness, but you know, I always have the opinion of, well, how are we supposed to forgive if we don't know who we're forgiving? And I do think forgiveness and truth are extremely important in reconciliation. And I don't think Northern Ireland will ever move on positively if we don't have that reconciliation. So, you know, I just think if we, we don't have the answer to, you know, why my uncle was killed you know who was there why it had to happen and you know I think that's always going to be a hard pill to swallow and um, you know my granny became a Christian after John died and she always maintained that she would just leave the justice and you know the revenge in the hands of the Lord and that that God would have the final say as far as the perpetrators were concerned but at the same time not having that truth is also a hard thing to live with. Um, you know, she, my granny wanted no retaliation for John's death. None of our family wanted retaliation. You know, why would we want to bring that level of hurt to another family? That's just, it's not, it's unheard of. Um, but our family would welcome the truth. You know, when, when the inquest into their deaths began, you know, they, we were promised transparency we were promised the truth but yet unfortunately time after time they're just faced with you know setback after setback and it is it's disheartening and it, it almost makes you think are we ever going to get anywhere you know I've often thought you know if when the time comes that you know my mom and my aunties you know pass on am I then going to be left in their shoes to try and gather the truth and then the more I thought about it I was like you know is it going to get to the point where it's the next generation that are going to have to carry on and get the truth? Like, at what point do we sort of say, well, I don't know anymore, you know, but all our family want, you know, is the truth. You know, what really happened that night, why it had to happen, who was there and, you know, why after all these years, nobody will come forward and give any sort of, you know, hope or information or anything that would just, you know, bring peace to our family and the other families as well that were involved that night, you know, just to give us some kind of closure. And I think that's probably the hardest pill to swallow. And other than that, I'd say, as I've said, John's, John's death probably has made me a more determined person to make this, to make Northern Ireland a better place. So my son doesn't have to grow up the way my family have had to. So. Well, you, uh, you said earlier on that it's up to your generation to, uh, to fix these things because certainly our generation my generation and Eugene's and Joe's um, we failed because there isn't reconciliation hasn't taken place there's a couple of things that you said obviously listening to your to your testimony there Becca you're uh, you're cut from the same cloth as your as your mother and and and, and your and your aunts um, there's this connection between you and and them and, and indeed the Reavy families, just decency and goodness. Um, 
But there is also a popular misconception when people look back and consider the Troubles, as, which is a strange name to call such a violent period. But that misconception is that these two communities faced off against each other all the time. It wasn't, it wasn't really the case, certainly wasn't always the case, because when you consider that the, uh, the, the Reavy brothers, in fact, maybe uh, one or two of the lads that were killed were playing pool just a couple of nights before that with some of the lads that were killed in Kingsmill. And I think that's, uh, uh, that's, that's a known fact. So the families or the communities where the, this, there was an active um, effort, a real effort to drive the communities against each other. Um, the name of our organization, as you, as you can see behind us, Truth and Reconciliation Platform, uh, you spoke about truth. Uh, is, is we, we deliberately put that, that word first, that you do need the truth. But sometimes the truth can be an inconvenient truth. And how do you think people will face up to that if they learn things that perhaps are not what they want to hear? I guess, I guess that's kind of not almost a risk. If you're, if you're wanting the truth, you know, you have to be willing to accept it and no matter what shape it comes, you know, you can't, you can't write it yourself and then hope they're going to say it back to you again. You know, I think that's something in Northern Ireland that is unfortunately a scary thought because, you know, you're totally oblivious to what the truth could be. At this point, it could be anything. And, you know, if you're so desperate to get the truth, then you sort of have to be willing to accept it in whatever form it comes. Um, and I think, I think at this point, um, I probably speak, I'll say I speak for myself on this one and not my family, but I think at this point for me, if any form of truth came out, you know, if it's the truth, then that's what happened. You can't argue with that. Um, and I guess that's, I think that's what it is. It's just wanting to know exactly what happened and why it happened. And maybe at that point, I don't know, maybe you would accept or you would gain a little bit of closure. Um, but again, I think it's just that risk that you're going to have to be willing to take. You know, the truth the truth and you can't argue with that. And you also mentioned that, you know, there is a school of thought out there that tells you that we must move on. But um, again, uh, we always reiterate in TARP that, you know, dealing with the legacy issues, dealing with the past is about the future. It's not just when we deal with the legacy issues, it, it impacts not only on the present, but definitely on the future. Well, thanks to Sarah Convery and to Becca Smith, to Eugene Reevy and Joe Campbell and to all our TARP colleagues who work so hard to raise the voices of victims. Special thanks to Ireland's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and to Tracy Dempsey for their continuing support, please visit our website tarp.global where you can learn more about the work of Truth and Reconciliation Platform.